Well, hello and welcome to Circus History Live. I'm Bruce Hawley, president of the Circus Historical Society. Circus History Live is produced monthly by the CHS. Tonight's episode features circus legend Elvin Bale. And now here's the host of Circus History Live, CHS Vice President, Chris Berry. Chris? Thanks, Bruce. You know, he's been called the greatest circus daredevil of the 20th century. And for any of us who saw him perform, I think that description fits very well. But as you're gonna learn now, Elvin Bale is much more than what we had seen in the center ring. Yes, tremendous performer, born into one of Europe's most celebrated circus families. He moved to the United States as a child, was at Ringling on, in 1956 when the Big Top came down for the last time. And through a lot of hard work, he became the superstar of the American circus and performing overseas too. Then with a life-changing accident uh, while performing one of his signature acts, he moved into circus management. He also has served as an agent and he's a mentor for many, many performers in the circus business today. Uh, still very much an active participant in the circus world. Elvin Bale, welcome to Circus History Live. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. And you too, Bruce. Thanks for both inviting me to uh, be on your Zoom, your Zoom show, whatever it is. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to uh, just kind of start this off a little bit by sharing really what I think was one of your signature acts. This is very brief, but this is absolutely something that uh, people will remember you for. So if you can see the video now, uh, I'm going to roll it here and watch this. watch this guy. Just unbelievable, Elvin. I mean, that that dive forward. How did you come up with that? <laughs> well, actually, um, when I was a kid on the show, Gerard Sewell's used to do the same type of act. He was heavier than me, but he did the heel catching trapeze act. And when I was working for my dad, taking care of the horses and the tigers, and I was basically a glorified groom, I decided that I didn't want to be a groom all my life. So I figured I, and I did the bicycle act with the family, but I decided I better do something on my own. So I looked at all, all the acts in the circus and I was so fortunate to be on the show in the early sixties. And there were so many great performers. There was the Flying Waynes, Harold Alzana and all these great performers. And so I used to practice with all of them. I used to practice with the Moroccans. We'd have competitions running down the track, hitting the, the little tramp trampoline and going as far as we could, and then doing a forward somersault and then landing on the mats and that kind of thing. And uh, Harold Lozano told me how to walk the wire. He'd put up his low practice wire and I would practice that. And he also taught me handstands. And then I used to practice with the Bokara Troop, which is Teterboard Troop, the Flying Wayne. So it was just a lot of fun. Everybody was practicing in the morning. So I used to get up in the morning and go to the, to the building and practice with everybody. It was more fun than anything else. But, you know, the Bale family uh, traces its circus roots back a couple of centuries, a few centuries now, at least four generations that I'm aware of, maybe even more. Tell me a little bit about your, your father in particular and coming over to the United States. Well, actually, my grandfather, they go back to the early 1800s as far as we can find. My, my great-grandfather came to the United States in the late 1800s, and he invested in a circus called the 100 Ranch Circus had Buffalo Bill, Annie Oakley, and people like that. Then he went back to England after that, and I don't know what happened, but my, this is what my father was telling me. And then he, had, he was involved in a circus there, and then my grandfather owned part of a circus, but they did mostly circus in vaudeville, and they did a bicycle act, roller bowler. My dad did roller bowler with my mother standing on his shoulders and juggling and all that kind of stuff. And my dad did animals. They did just about everything. Worked in England, Ireland, Scotland, all over the place in Europe. So, you know, um, when you look back at really uh, those post-war years, I mean, you you were on circuses in Europe, you know, right after World War II. Uh, tell me a little bit about some of your earliest recollections of being in the circus world. Well, I was born pretty much on my dad's circus, even though I was born in a hospital. I was born in King's College Hospital in London, but my dad had his own circus during the end of the war. During the war, it wasn't after the war. It was called Trevor's International and Allied Circus. And he traveled in most of the major parks in London. And so he did just about everything in the show. 
he ended up having to close the show after the war because um, the people in the box office kind of took a lot of the money and he went out of money because they kind of robbed him. So he ended up closing the show and then he then became, he was an animal trainer to begin with. So he went to different circuses, training animals for different circuses, doing the bike act and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, in, the, in the, those years immediately after World War II, John Ringling North went over to Europe. He hired a lot of acts. I mean, Dieter Tasso, the four whirlwinds. Uh, and one of them that he hired was the Bale family, your mother, father, uh, you and your four, and your, and your sisters. Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, either family lore or stories that you remember about coming to the United States. Yeah, it was great. Uh, my dad was working in Sweden. And John Ringling North came over there and he saw the show and he saw my dad working, I think it was polar bears and lions and tigers. He had a mixed group. And he asked my dad if he'd be interested in taking over some wild tigers that he'd just gotten. And my dad said, uh, yeah. And my mother said, no, 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 no. We don't want to go to America. And they said, why? She says, well, because that one big town, Chicago, all the gangsters, we don't want to, I don't want to go to America. <laughs> and my dad said, don't be silly. So anyway, my dad ended up signing a contract with my father, with, with John Ringling North. And we came over here right after Christmas of 1953. And we moved into Circus City, which we lived in a railroad car. I don't know if you know, in those days, they had all those railroad cars encompassing Circus City. And they had trailers in the middle with a different way for me. So this is very close to where the old uh, winter quarters was. Right, uh, over right next to the winter quarters, except between what? the winter quarters on one side was Captain Hire with his starless night. I don't know if you remember Captain Hire. He did dressage. Yep, right off of uh, what's now Beneva Road, right? Yes. And but right behind us was Bobby Jones Golf Course. So, but we could walk to the to the winter quarters, which was really great. So anyway, we we moved there, and my dad went and to the winter quarters every day to practice the tigers. And he also, John Ringling North kind of left my dad in charge of a lot of the animals there because my dad stayed there all year in, in uh, 1953 to just train all the animals. So, and so and again, we, this is this cool. is in the early 1950s. This is still, you know, I mean, the big big top and uh, all of those acts that. That we saw you remember those those times too i guess absolutely you know as a kid in 1954 when we went on the show um it was terrific we were there and there was a lot of kids on the show the carolis from the caroli family you know the bisbeenies and my god there were so many kids on the show of uh, vicky Eunice. but we were on one side of the tent and other performers were on the other side and as kids we were not allowed to go on the other side of the tent i don't know why but we were not that's just how it was. And you know, in those days, the kids, we were all very well behaved. My father brought us up with a strong hand. And uh, yes, it was really, we had a great time under the big top in those days. And living on the train too, right? I mean- we Lived on uh, the train. However, my dad had to have an American car. So we used to drive overland and I used to have to read the map and half the time I fell asleep and my dad would say, are we on the right road? And I go, oh, I wake up and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was scared to death to say I fell asleep. And sometimes we get lost. <laughs> he gets so mad at me because I said, yeah, yeah, we're on the right road. And we weren't. Because in those <laughs> days, you had to read the map. We didn't know where we were going in those days. They didn't have arrows or right. anything like that because nothing went over the road except a couple of performers with cars. But my dad had to have a car. I didn't want, didn't want to ride the bus. But we rode the bus for 25 cents. It was fun. You still had a stateroom on the train, though, right? The bail, yeah. the bail state? My dad yeah. had, uh, we, were, we were at the end of the married couple's car, car number 370. We had the big generators right next to us uh, with a door, but you couldn't go in there. You know, it was not the right thing to go into the generator room. So we'd have to go from our stateroom. We had full width stateroom. We'd have to walk through the married couple's car. And the car that's connected to 370 was John Ringling North. That was oh, his car. That was Joe Mar, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he was in there a lot. And we used to meet him on the vestibule and coming and going quite a lot. And then when his son would come to visit, John Ringling the second, when he'd get out of school, he'd come to he'd come to the train with his with his school shorts on and his his school jacket and you know, and we'd we'd mess around on the vestibule and that kind of thing. And 
his uh, John Ringling's North chef would come out and give us stuff that he'd baked, cookies and pastries and stuff like that. So I happen to know that uh, one of uh, the people who really took a shine to you uh, is the fellow who I'm uh, showing his picture right now, uh, Art Cancelo. So um, tell me a little bit about your relationship with him. I mean, he was, you know, general manager of the show uh, for, for a time there in the 50s. Uh, tell me about Art. Yeah, well, he, he was the general manager, but he was really more than that. I mean, he was it. John Ringling North, sometimes he was there, but he was in the office and he didn't really get involved with the show. Art was really involved, but then Tuffy Jenners was also one of the managers. And there was also other, lots of other managers on the show that uh, became circus owners and worked in the circus. But we called him Uncle Art because uh, it's just the way we were raised. And my father would say, you know, you don't call him Mr. Cancelo, just, you know, his Uncle Art. And that's what he was for many, many years. And we had a great relationship. My father and, and Art got along very well. Um, and they they loved my sister, my little sister, Bonnie. Um, she was like um, Shirley Temple. And they used to, uh, Art and Maggie would used to take her all over the place with them. When they'd go places, they'd say, come on, let's get Bonnie. We'll take Bonnie with us. They They loved her. So uh, again, you know, we've got a lot that we're going to cover here during this uh, conversation. We might even have to have you back for another one at some point. But I want to fast forward uh, to actually today. We are recording this on July the 16th, 2023. And it was actually, let's see, what, what would be about uh, 60, well, it was July the 16th, 1956 was the day that the Ringling Big Top went down for the last time in Pittsburgh. You were there. In yes. fact, this is a photograph here that we're looking at. at well, the there's me. <laughs> racetrack. Now, you were a kid at the time, obviously, but I, I imagine you're in that picture someplace. Well, let me tell you what. I was a kid, but I used to sell peanuts on the, in the Midway for 15 cents a bag. And uh, I always used to be scared because when people would say, oh, give me five bags, I go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'd be counting because I didn't have a lot of school in those days. And so I was always concerned. And once in a while, when I'd go back to the Coke tent, which maybe you guys don't know what that is, the Coke tent, that was the famous tent where they used to gamble and everybody would get their Cokes from. They, the butchers sometimes would take me and shake me upside down as a big joke to shake all the, the change out of my pockets, that kind of thing. But yes, I was on the Midway and um, it was pretty scary. So tell, let's talk, I mean, again, I know you are trying your role but, um, and if, if people could mute their, mute their microphones, that would be very helpful. Um, so when 1956, uh, you're nine years old, but you know your dad is a major performer on the show at that time. Uh, what were they talking about uh, leading up to the show closing in Pittsburgh in July? Well, actually, um, as far as I can remember, it was kind of a shock to everybody. They didn't really tell everybody until I think it was like the day before. And they decided to close because it got really bad with the Teamsters. And, you know, they were always concerned about what they call a hay rube, which is, you know, our guys. And don't forget, we had a thousand working guys on the show in those days, a thousand. And the show used to feed all those guys in the cookhouse. And the cookhouse was another story. That was an <laughs> amazing place. But uh, yeah, and the police were there and, and a lot of our guys got into fights. And of course, it was always a problem. So um I think it was a day before, or two days before they made the announcement that they were closing the show. And let me tell you what, for a lot of those people, it was terrible because it was in the middle of the summer. They had no other work to go to. And in those days, people didn't make a lot of money. They were living from day to day. So, you know, here you are, this young British kid. Uh, you're with your family. Uh, your, your father's livelihood, the family's livelihood has ended. Do you remember that train ride back to Sarasota at all? Do you remember uh, kind of deciding that because you were a part of the show the following season too. Actually, um, I don't remember the ride home because I believe I went with my dad in the car. But um, I remember the train arriving, you know, there was three sections in those days. So we had to wait for the last section for the family, you know, my mother and the, and the girls to come. But um, we, uh, we actually, my dad actually ended up buying a, a trailer when he got home. 
and he, he bought some a piece of property out in Fruitville and he put a trailer on the property for us to live in. But here's the thing about my dad. John Ringling North, my dad, and John Ringling North in Arkansas kept my dad on. My dad was one of the only person other than the elephant trainer, I think it was, that was kept on, on the payroll for the whole rest of the year. And John Ringling North, of course, uh, you know, had to make that difficult decision uh, to close the show, but he also worked with uh, Uncle Art Cancello to make sure that in 1957, the show would return. And as you said, uh, you know, I guess probably because your father had uh, control of so many of those animals, right? That uh, they needed somebody to be in charge of that. Yeah, well, they had the tigers and my dad was also training uh, the riding tiger and a couple of other things. And anyway, yeah, so. So, so he, I, I want to take... I want to take you back down memory lane a little bit here more. This is a photograph from 1957, Madison Square Garden, 1957. What are we looking at here? That's called the loop in the loop. Um, my dad put that, and that's steel. That's not aluminum. My dad put that on his shoulders, and he rode that around the track. That's your father on the motorcycle. That's my Trevor Bale on, on the motorcycle. motorcycle. That's my mother inside the wheel. Irene and then Bale. Smith holding the wheel. Well, she wasn't actually holding it. The guys actually behind her lifted it onto my dad's shoulders. And she was basically just presenting the act there. And she was helping my mother to get in, in the wheel. This bicycle act was, uh, again, one of the defining acts of the Bale family at that period with your sisters and yourself, right? Yeah, my dad did comedy in the act. He rode at what they call a bedstead, which is the end of a bed metal and he made a bicycle out of it and he rode a 12 foot unicycle and my dad and I well I didn't do too much in the bike act then I wasn't in the bike act in those years it was just the girls and my dad but I joined and the again, bike you, act. and again you said that's Maggie Smith in the back and of course she later married Art Cancello too yes that was Art's girlfriend at that time yes so, um, you know, when you look back on on kind of growing up in the circus, because you you did and you've continued this lifetime in the circus. I mean, how was it being a kid around the greatest show on earth? Great. <laughs> what can I say? I didn't want to go to school. I hated school. My dad sent us to school in Scotland and I hated it. It was they had fleas in the circus and there was water on the floor. And I remember not going to school. I used to hide under the trucks all day long. Here's a, picture, here's a picture of you and your sisters and your dad. Uh, I think this is a little bit later on, but yeah. uh, the horse act, again. That's you know, the, the horse I think part. that's 62 or 63. He did the buggy acts. Uh, they did the buggy acts in those days, and my dad did high school. Um, and they did the buggy acts with Charles Morosky, did the Liberty Act in the middle and that kind of thing. And I was just a groom. I didn't really do too much other than, well, I shouldn't say I didn't do too much. I took care of the horses with my dad. He always kind of had a groom, but I used to help with the horses and I would work in the ring with the horses and I took care of the tigers, even though he had a groom, I had to be there to help with the tigers. I was his cage boy. I'd help put the tigers in with Charlie Smith because Charlie Smith, he was head of transportation in those days and he'd drive the cages in and I'd unhook them and push them up to the cage and that kind of thing. And then, uh, well, and. I don't want to go on and bore you guys, sorry. No, I think it's not boring at all. You've got a crowd here that's uh, loving this stuff. So, you know, again, when we look back on that era of the indoor circus, uh, 1957 to, a, I guess it was probably 1963, which was the last uh, year that you were on the show, um, the Bale family did a lot of acts. I mean, you know, people think of Gunther Gable Williams as being such an important part of the Red Unit, which he was for so many seasons. But you guys, and how many acts did you have on the Ringling Circus at that time? Oh, at that time, uh, we had the three horse acts and the bicycle act and the, my dad was the ringmaster, along with Harold Runk. They, Harold Runk was the announcer and my dad was the ringmaster. And we're gonna talk about Harold Runk a little bit more because uh, those of us who saw you- in those, days, in those days, in the 60s, I had jobs too. Uh, I remember that Uncle Art put me to, I drove the clown car. Oh, really? I big, and I sat on a little box and I drove the clown car. And then 
Then they said, oh, Elvin, we need you in the clown act. So I said, what clown act? They said, well, we want you in the back of this horse. The phony, thumb, you know, when you get the guy in the front and the guy in the back of these kind of comedy horse things. And they put me in the back of this comedy horse with a guy, a clown called Red Honkola. And I like Red, but he drank a lot and he never took a bath. And there was no <laughs> air in the back of that horse. And I'll never forget, I went on the Johnny Carson show and, you know, it's scripted. Most of those shows were all scripted because I did Johnny Carson. I did so many TV shows. I did What's My Line, To Tell the Truth, all of those old shows. So anyway, I'm on the show with Johnny Carson and, and my line was, he was asking me if I, what I did. And I said, oh yeah, I was telling you about, telling you about this horse act. And so his, his line was, well, what part of the horse were you? And my line was, not the part that eats. But he said, what part of the horse are you? And before I could say a word, he said, oh, not the part that eats, I bet, because he wanted to laugh. Oh. He ruined my, <laughs> my comedic career, my stand-up comedian. I, I said, oh, well, that's it. I'm done. Can't, do, can't be a comedian if he steals, steals my lines. <laughs> <laughs> we did TV with Charlton Heston. We did, oh, my God, so many things we did. I don't know. You know, it's such a shame. I don't know if anybody ever heard of the TV series called The Greatest Show on Earth. Yeah, with absolutely, Charles with Lucille Ball and uh, Desi Arnaz. Russ Tamblyn yep. and um, uh, Choose the Weld and a bunch of, oh, uh, Robert Weber, a bunch of big stars were in that TV series. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great show. Um, your family uh, have all been performers. Uh, tell us a little bit, here's a, here's a picture of the Bale family. Probably, what do you think about Early 60s? Yeah, that was early 60s because I have that jacket on. That was for the web, the web number. Uh, I used to be a web sitter and they used to give me the strongest girls I could find. <laughs> because... so, so let's start with your dad there. Let's kind of run run through the family and tell us a little bit about your sisters and what they were doing on the show and what they've gone on to do uh, now. Right. Well, in those days, uh, my dad obviously was the tiger trainer and the ringmaster and right to his right, is my little sister Bonnie, and she actually was also in Spec. Uh, she was in Alice. She played Alice, Alice in Wonderland, and then uh, uh, to her right is Gloria, my oldest sister, and then down here, the one that looks like Elizabeth Taylor in the black hair is my twin sister Nita, and then to her right is my mom, and they all did Web, and my sister Nita rode um, Diamond, the elephant Diamond. Okay, yeah. In the production yeah. number. Very interesting. Um, so yeah, yeah obviously uh, you, you all look as though you're really enjoying uh, that day, and uh, you know it's it's really great to be able to kind of look back at that with you to kind of show a little bit about uh, you know what was going on on the show at that time. But then you decided that you wanted to have an act of your own. Yep. You yep. wanted to you wanted to become a trapeze performer. Tell me a little bit about you know kind of how that all came about actually. Well, I was, like I said, I was my dad's groom taking care of the animals and I had three beautiful sisters. So everybody liked the girls on the trapeze and the girls with the horses and they didn't want Elvin, you know, he was just a guy, you know, big deal. So I really wasn't doing anything except the bike act in those days. And I'd stand in for my dad to announce once in a while, if he had to change to, to get into one of the acts that was on the shrine shows. But, um, I, I used to come and practice with all the performers. I practiced with Harold Alzano and I practiced with uh, the Flying Waynes and the Bacaras Cheetah Board. And with the Moroccans, we used to have competitions, seeing how far we could go on the trampoline kind of thing. So I, I learned to, to be able to use my body a lot. And I looked around at all the different acts and I used to like Mr. Eunice's act. That was great. And I said, wow, that'd be a great act because there's an act that's only one person. And I said, well, I don't want to do a flying act because you have to have all these people. And if the catcher gets sick or I'm the catcher and flyer gets sick, you can't work or the teeterboard board act, you need a lot of people. I wanted to do something by myself. So it was between Eunice or Gerard Sewells who did trapeze. And actually when I was seven years old, I think it's on my website, I was doing trapeze. I learned trapeze already at seven years old. Wow. My son was doing it. So that was in England I was doing that. So I decided to do the Hill Catching Trapeze Act because I figured, hey, trapeze doesn't eat. I don't have to feed it. 
I can just put it in the trunk of the car and away I go. So I started to practice the Trapeze Act in Madison Square Garden, I think it was in 1962. Early 1962, I started practicing. I practiced for a year, night and day. And, and I know you've told me you didn't get a whole lot of support from uh, really anybody, right? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody even knew I was practicing. My dad didn't know. Uh, my sister knew because I used to borrow her trapeze once in a while, but I made my own and um, I would hang the trapeze wherever I could hang it to start with. And then after a few months, I asked my sister if I could practice on her trapeze because she was actually doing trapeze on one in one ring and Donna uh, Gautier was doing trapeze in the other end ring and Gerard Sewell's was in the middle ring. So I, early, early, early in the morning, and it was sometimes so dark, and I would tie her web so that I could reach it to swing myself. So I would put my mechanic on, I made one myself, and I put my mechanic on and I would practice on her trapeze in the morning, and then I would practice on her trapeze late at night. And then after I would practice the trapeze late at night, I would go to the pie car on the train and I would get a free meal but I would have to mop the floor for my free meal. So, I, and I didn't have any money in those days, although I did sell concessions and I worked in the, in the George Hannaford Writing Act in the early sixties, I was his stooge. Uh, oh. so I did the clown car, the horse. I worked with George Hannaford and Vicky and Diane Hannaford. Um, and um, so it was the horses and I did the concessions, sold whirlybirds for Pifka, so I, I was pretty busy. So it's uh, 1963. Uh, I know kind of an interesting story about uh, the 1963 season, which was the last year that you were uh, on the show when you closed uh, that November, I think it was in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, what, what are your recollections of that day? Well, we closed in Cleveland, Ohio, and I remember in the morning I had a long practice and I came out of the building and I, I went up the stairs and I came out of the side of the building. There was two, two doors there. And I went out the door and Lawson had his semi parked there. And I came out of the building and I saw Mr. Lawson actually was just walking around the back of his semi. They were getting stock out to sell. Willis uh, Lawson uh, around the show for many, many years. Yeah. Yeah. He was a concession manager. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, he said, hey, did you hear what happened? And I said, no, what happened? And he said, uh, they just shot Kennedy. I said, what? Wow. Said, yeah, they just shot Kennedy. I couldn't believe it. That was, that was uh, what, July 22nd? This, yeah, uh, November 22nd, um, 1963. So um, that was the closing day of the Ringling Circus uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, at that point, your dad decides uh, you're going to do some additional circus work uh, outside of Ringling, uh, his own circus, and you're going to make your debut on the trapeze. Right. Well, we knew we knew we weren't coming back um, because uh, John Ringling North had hired Charlie Bauman to come over to work the, the, the Tiger Act, his Tiger Act. So they brought the whole act over and they retired my dad's tigers. And um, so, yeah, we, we went to Venice and my dad started practicing his acts. And this is this is the honest truth. I'd been practicing all year. And my father never saw me. So he said, okay, come on, let's see what you can do. So I said, okay. So we set up the trapeze because my sister had the outdoor rigging anyway. So we set up my trapeze on her rigging. And I trapeze for the first time and showed my dad. And that was after a year's practice. And he said, oh, not bad. <laughs> my dad, you know, he, he, he was a funny guy. So he said, oh yeah, not bad. He said, but... Uh, why do you have the mechanic on? I said, well, because it's practice. He said, no, take it off. I said, well, now? He said, yeah, take it off now. He says, I'll, I'll catch you. I said, well, what do you mean you'll catch me? I said, hopefully I won't miss. So anyway, <laughs> that's what I did. So I, I did the whole act for him and that's the first time I took the mechanic off. And then um, I think it was like a week or two later, we went to Fort Worth, Texas. My dad put on a, a Christmas show for, uh, him and a, and a circus fan who went to this majestic theater, which they were going to condemn. And he put on a Christmas show there with, with animals. In the theater there, the majestic theater. Yeah, but my dad 
Saint Santa Claus, and my sister was a little girl that came and sat on his lap, and he said, oh, 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 what do you want for Christmas, little girl? And she said, I want a live circus. So then the curtains opened, and there was a ring, and my dad had hired all kinds of acts. We had Frankie Saludo, Catchy Number, and God, who was the who was the chimps? He had chimps, ponies. He had all kinds of acts. I did trapeze. My sister did trapeze. So yeah, we did the bike act, all kinds of things. And and meanwhile, your trapeze uh, work is getting the attention of uh, Uncle Art Cancelo, and he uh, is is no is doing other things, being involved in European at a time when nobody was going to Russia to perform. Tell us a little bit about that opportunity because that was really unique in 1968. Yeah, well, uh, if you remember correctly, there was a, a, a Russian circus that came over, the Morris Shelfen, who owned Sir Holiday on Ice. Morris Shelfen bought the first Russian circus over to the United States and they sent a circus over to, to Russia. And in the early, in the 60s, my my family we all we all did uh, shrine shows for Rudy uh, Rudy Bundy sorry uh, Sid Kellner Howard Sees Hammond Morton and oh my God uh, all kinds These of are all those big indoor circuses Pollock Brothers and uh, the Shrine and Police circuses all over the United States Yep Yep and in like sixty five we were on the Hammond show and then in the summer George Hammond asked well. For the season of the George Hammett show, which was from early, I think it was February until the summer, which was something like the end of May, uh, we did we did shrine dates for him, and I worked George's camel. I worked the act because he needed someone to work the camel act, so I worked the camel act for him. And I did trapeze. We did the bicycle acts. We did three horse acts, three aerial acts. We did like eight acts in those days. Anyway. Um, we were we were on the on the road with uh, at that time we were with um, I think it was Howard Cease and uh, I got a message to call Arcancello so he said when you're coming home and I said we'll be home pretty soon so he said well when you get home I want you to come and see me come to my railroad car said, the railroad car okay so we went home and uh, I found out where his railroad car was parked it was almost downtown in Sarasota. And so I went there and he asked me if I'd be interested in going to Russia with it, with the circus for Marshall. And I said, yeah, and that was 1967. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. He said, okay. He said, well, we we leave in, in August. So you've got plenty of time to, to prepare and whatever. So I went on the road with my dad that year until uh, August. And then I left the family and I went to Russia with with Uncle Art and Maggie. We are uh, wow. we have Elvin, we have Elvin Bale as our uh, guest here on Circus History Live. Circus History Live is presented uh, monthly by the Circus Historical Society. It's an opportunity to talk to those who have been involved uh, in circus history in our lifetimes and preserve that history for future generations. We have Elvin Bale with us now, uh, a member of not only the International Circus Hall of Fame, Bale family is also part of the Circus Ring of Fame in Sarasota. And I wanna just kind of take a moment here, Elvin, and uh, remind folks who are on the call here today that the Circus Ring of Fame nominations uh, came out earlier this week. And there are a lot of terrific folks who uh, have been nominated for the Ring of Fame this year. I hope you will go to uh, circusringoffame.com, take a look at that. And uh, the Circus Historical Society uh, is actually pleased that one of our board members, producer Wayne McCary, is one of those who's been nominated. So uh, as you're looking at the different names, uh, I personally hope you keep Wayne in mind because he's uh, definitely one of the good guys. Uh, back now that the commercial's over with Elvin, this experience in uh, Russia, I mean, this is 1967. You know, this is the, the 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 Cold War has heated up in Vietnam at that point. I mean, it is you know U.S. Soviet relations are not really uh, that good. What was it like to be an American performer in Russia? Wow, <laughs> let me tell you, it was amazing. Before we even left, we had a meeting with the State Department and a couple of CIA guys, in the, in the, I think we. Were, I'm not sure if it was the Belvedere Hotel or the Jefferson Hotel, but in the hotel before we left New York, because we all flew from Sarasota to New York, we had to stay there overnight to catch a chartered plane, it was Pan Am, um, into Moscow. And we met with these guys and they were telling us that you can't take the movie or any movies like Dr. Shivago with you. You can't take books. You can't talk to people. You can't do this. 
can do that, all kinds of different things that we weren't allowed to do. And it was very, very interesting just to hear all these things that we couldn't do. But we weren't, none of us were really scared because it was a cultural exchange and we knew that we were going to have escorts all the time and and we did. And I, a couple of guys talked to me, no, I can't really talk about it. But I also did something for the State Department over there that I really can't talk about. Well, you know, I think that I will say this, um, and it, those readers of Bandwagon know that there have been other uh, people who've been involved in the American circus who have used probably their cover uh, as being circus uh, executives or performers to uh, have uh, helped out uh, their country. And so uh, if you did that too, I think that, uh, you know, we Wasn't appreciate Cyril that. Cyril Mills, one of those guys? I'm sorry? Wasn't Cyril Mills, didn't he? Cyril Mills, uh, the the British, uh, the British yeah, uh, circus owner, yes, British circus producer. In fact, I did uh, what year? In the nineties, I went to England to Thames Television and did "This Is Your Life" with Cyril Mills. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and then the other one, and I'll just kind of, since people are probably wondering what I'm talking about here, <laughs> is um, Henry Ringling North uh, was uh, in the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. He, um, he continued uh, after the war in the Navy Reserve, uh, continued to advance uh, in the Navy Reserve. Uh, I talked to his son, John Ringling North II, a little bit about his dad's career, and he thinks that his father probably uh, assisted in some of his trips to Eastern Europe also. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why um, Henry Ringling North is actually now at Arlington National Cemetery is where he's buried, even though he was living in Europe when he died. So anyway, that just a little bit of uh, background there on what I was talking about. Thank you for that. No, that's great. Yeah, I, I've heard that. That's terrific. Yeah. So anyway, back to uh, to this this young fellow who is uh, starting to wow people with this tremendous uh, trapeze act that you're doing. Uh, obviously, you know, Her Irvin Feld buys uh, the circus from the North family. Uh, decides he's going to have two shows, and he's got a staff up. And uh, 1969 Blue Unit, Elvin Bales back in the United States and back with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. Well, it wasn't that simple. <laughs> Actually, so I tell us the, the story. I engineered the whole thing uh, with the help of Rudy Bundy. And, and how did because that I wanted, happen? I wanted to go on Ringling and I had heard that uh, the Felds bought the show and that they were gonna open another unit. And I said, wow, I would love to be on the show. So um, I called Mr. Rudy Bundy and I said, Mr. Bundy, I said, do you have any influence with the Fells? I said, I know the Fells in a way because when, when in the 60s, they promoted Ringling. They promoted Ringling. I remember my dad meeting them in, in the Ice House in Washington, DC. I think it was on 18th Street or Avenue. But anyway, yeah, they, they promoted the show. So uh, my dad kind of knew them and I knew of them, of course. And so Mr. Bundy said, no, he said, you know, he says right now, Charlie Rodin is booking all the acts for the circus, for the sh new show, for both shows. I said, wow, I said, and I don't know this Mr. Charlie Rodin. I said, do you have any way of getting a hold of him? He said, well, let me, let me see if I can, you know, give you a number, he said, but I think he's gonna be, in those days they didn't have cell phone. It was difficult to, talk to anybody or get a hold of anybody. So I called the office and I left a, a number at the building. We were in El Paso and there was a phone in the back door. So uh, I left a message for Rudy, but for uh, Charlie Rodin. And I basically sat at the phone for like three days <laughs> in the back of the building, waiting, hoping that he'd call. And every time the phone rang for somebody, I'd say, who, who is it, who is it? And so he finally called. And I said, you know, I'd really like to, go on the show and I do this heel catching act and I was in Russia. Thank God that I had something like that to say. And I've been doing shrine circuses and yeah, yeah, okay, well, let me think about it. So anyway, um, he he sent me a, a telegram and, and said that he'd come to see the show. So I, at that time, uh, Pat Anthony had gotten me a job with, uh, I don't know if any guys ever remember uh, a guy called um, Jim Hetzer. He had yes. a in the round yep. and so so um pat talked to mr hetzer into hiring me for the that tour that he had in those three circus of the round buildings and i was there with um herda clauser 
and John Cuneo and Pat Anthony. They had some big acts in there. And so- um, This is in California, right? Yeah, most in California. Yeah. One yeah. was in San Jose, one was in um, San Francisco, basically just south of San Francisco, and yeah. the other one was in Salt Lake City. So it ended up where I picked up uh, Mr. Charlie Rodin in San Francisco, because that's where we were playing. And I drove him to the building and he watched the show and he went back and I, and I ended after the show, I took him back to the airport. I think he stayed overnight in the hotel, uh, which you know, was his thing. So uh, he said, well, I'll let you know. So a couple of weeks went by and the next thing I know, I got a message saying that Mr. Feld agreed to hire you. So, so you know, that 1969 season, uh, obviously, you know, there are so many stories about putting together that, that show as quickly as they did. But this was a situation where you were, the, you were in the center ring and the, the web acts were around you, right? Yeah, because here's the other thing that I didn't tell you. Um, after I did the Hetzer tour, uh, Mr. Trolley Rodin told me that Mr. Feld was probably going to go and see a couple of shows around the country, a couple of the bigger shows. And I said, where? He said, well, I know he's going to go to Chicago to see L.N. Fleckel's show, the big shrine show there. I think it was the big, big police circus. So I said, really? I said, yeah. So anyway, here I am. I'm scrambling to try to find this, this guy, L.N. Fleckel's, who I, I never heard of him before. So I finally found, got hold of his office in Chicago and I called his office and who, who is this? And I told him my name and I said, oh, I was in Russia and I do a hill catching trapeze act. He said, well, he said, I'm, I'm booked. He said, uh, uh, I've got Bobby Barasini. Now, Bobby Barasini saw me perform and Bobby copied me and he started doing the hill catching trapeze act in Vegas and he was doing the orangutans, the trapeze, and then he fell from the trapeze. So he gave it up. But he didn't fall until afterwards. So anyway, I said to, to Mr. Fleckles, I said, look, Mr. Fleckles, I said, it's a 10 day date. I said, I'll do the whole date for 500 bucks. He said, the 10 days for $500? I said, yeah, he said, gee, he said, uh, okay. He said, well, uh, that's half of what I was gonna pay. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. I said, I don't care, I'll do it. I would have done it for nothing. So anyway, sure. he hired me. And when and I- Was Urban Fell, did he come to the show? I don't know. I don't know if he ever did or not. If he did, I didn't know, but I didn't care because I already was going to go there. So I wanted to be there and I wanted to perform and I, and I performed there in the center ring. And after that is when I got the contract. So, um, and there, again, we have so much to talk about coming up here, but I just want to talk about the trapeze act just a little bit more uh, because you did so many, so many more things, but this trapeze act, I mean, you were absolutely doing things that no one had ever seen before without a net. I mean, uh, good looking guy. Uh, you must have really uh, felt as though, you know, you were, you arrived. You know, the upbringing we had, I never had an ego. I just wanted to, to perform and I just wanted to do my best. Um, so that's what I did. I was I can't tell you how excited I was and how happy and proud I was to be even on the show. It was a dream. It's a dream come true for most people to, to be on Ringling Brothers. Let's face it, it's the best. And I have to say that the Felds treated me great. What can I say? I did everything that I was supposed to do. I, I never gave them a hard time. I always did my job. I always did the publicity, did whatever they asked me to do. So. And I, I worked hard. I mean, it was it was hard work doing that act every day, sometimes doing nine, nine shows over the weekend when we did nine packs or six packs. Um, I My legs would bleed. I remember when I did uh, Circus Superheroes, my legs were full of blood in the back from pumping because it was against the wind. And I never forget, Kenneth said to me, wow, you're all full of blood. And I said, yeah. He said, well, tell you what, he said, take the first show off. <laughs> I said, gee, thanks, Kenneth. After I'd been filming all morning, right? Oh, that was funny. So 1973, we're going to kind of fast forward a little bit. Uh, you went to Madrid, uh, the Circus World Festival. Is that what you were referring to right there? That's, and you were, you 
received the Circus Oscar basically yes. for your work on the trapeze. Actually, uh, I did the trapeze and the motorcycle with, with Vicki Eunice. And we're going to talk about the motorcycle too, but you know, Vicki Eunice is someone again who you must have grown up with uh, in Sarasota, right? I did. I grew up with Vicki on the show and uh, the Force Twins, which is you know, yeah. Johnny P's wife, we were all on the show together when we were kids. You turned Bridget uh, Forst, yeah. Fairy yeah. Forst, who was a magician uh, in the center ring in the early 60s on the uh, yeah. Ringling Circus. Yeah, and Johnny um, used to sleep in my bedroom uh, down in Venice after my dad built the house. He'd come down there and stay with me. You know, the uh, the awards that you, you, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the Circus Ring of Fame, this International uh, Hall of Fame, uh, this Oscar. Uh, and then in 1976, in 1976, you went to Monte Carlo for the first time. And uh, I'm gonna show a picture here. So here you are, obviously it had, the trapeze has not gone up yet, but I think that's Princess Caroline that's standing there next to you, right? Yeah, we were doing publicity and, um... We became close. We were good friends. In fact, her and her brother uh, and ancestor. But she, I don't know, you can see her face there. We kind of hit it off. Yeah, she, uh, and what a supporter of the circus she has always been and continues to be too. It's, it's terrific. Well, her, sister, her sister more so. That was oh, Carolyn. Okay. Stephanie, uh, yeah. Stephanie really is the oh, one. Caroline. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, you're right. That was Caroline that I had taken the pictures with in those days. Stephanie was a little younger. Stephanie was there, but she wasn't that involved. But but Caroline was, of course. And uh, in 1976 for the trapeze. That's Caroline, that's Caroline right there on the left. I don't know if you can see her in the box. Oh, yeah, there she is uh, over there. She's clapping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, you won the uh, gold clown in 76 for the trapeze. Uh, yeah. And then in 1979, uh, you had a new act that you were uh, doing, uh, a daredevil act, really, probably the things that now when we look back on, when we look back on your career, it's those daredevil acts, obviously the trapeze act was, you know, death defying, but the, the wheel, tell us, I mean, at that time, what we now know as the wheel of death, the, or the wheel of destiny, whatever, uh, you know, you were really the first one, they called you the Phantom of Balance back in those days. Yeah. Yeah, Story. actually, there's a song written uh, by Russell and Hardin. Uh, Patricia Russell wrote a song about the Phantom of Balance, who's walking the wheel. He's walking the wheel for a thrill. I have a copy of it. It's on their album. Huh, very but interesting. They call me the Phantom of Balance. Now, I wasn't the original wheel walker, but the way I did the act was different than Johnny Luxem and Lee Heisinger, because they were the two that were running around in the, the country in those days. So well, I did more of a thrill thrill thing than just walking around it. I'm gonna show a video here. Uh, I'm gonna just bear with me a second here. I wanna make sure that uh, we're able to get you the audio on this also. Um, and what, what this is folks is uh, Elvin uh, on a, um, one of the highlights of the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, which aired each year. This is the 1978 edition. Uh, Dick Van Dyke is the host, and uh, this is Elvin doing the, the. I guess we called it the Wheel of Death at that time. Oh, yeah. oh, you this is the giant gyro wheel. Some people call it the treacherous treadmill of death. Every performance, a man risks his life by walking the outer rim of this steel cage, 40 feet in the air at a speed of 70 miles an hour. And what's more, he does it blindfolded. There's just one word for a man of his caliber, nuts. <laughs> Here he is, the phantom of balance, the amazing Elvin Bale. Good luck, Elvin. <laughs> now, before...
Now this is something you don't see a lot when you see this act today. Tremendous upper body strength there, Kelvin. Uh, obviously from your trapeze work, it's amazing. Never seen this. This is great. Elvin Dale now walks the whirling wheel of death blindfolded. I'm not going to watch this either. If he's afraid to look, so am I. Because they, because of the game on TV. Oh, we didn't do the fall. Yeah. Pretty amazing, Elvin. Really terrific. Well, that wasn't the whole act. And like I said, oh, okay. I didn't. Okay, let's get back to it then. And there was no run. In a, in a, just a couple of minutes here, we're going to take a look at uh, how you took the act to the next level uh, when uh, Chris Adams uh, was involved with the act a little later on. But oh, that oh. We, the Wheel of Death, I mean, how many times did you do that thing? Hundreds. I, it, it got a, were there ever any problems? Yeah. And you know, that thing was steel and it weighed a thousand pounds and it was heavy to get around. Let me tell you. I can only <laughs> imagine. Not like now with all the aluminum ones now, it, it's, and they're so much smaller. And that, that wheel was 39 feet. It was wow. above the, the frames when, when it was just sitting there. Amazing. So, so the act itself, you know, how did you move that thing on the train? It had its own wagon that went on the train. They, the, the, Mr. Feld built a special wagon for it, and they just lowered into the wagon. We'd take it apart, but it had its own wagon. It's called the wheel wagon. Huh. Well, then, um, so, so the uh, I'm I'm queuing us up here to the next uh, thing that I want to show everybody, which is um, when you started doing the cannon, the space shuttle. You called it in uh, in 1978, and the thing about it is, you know, I was looking at this, Elvin. The space, the actual space shuttle, didn't even launch until 1981. So you were definitely ahead of your ahead of your time on that <laughs> yeah do you have you don't do you have all the pictures with all of the astronauts i do not unfortunately that sounds like a great uh a great one we'll have to have that next time we have you on yeah when when we first opened it uh the i don't know who the promoter was but they notified all the astronauts because we were down in, in miami sure and, uh, we were also in west palm beach and they all came down to see the human space shuttle that and is great. Al Warden flew Apollo uh, 15, I think it was. Excuse me. Al Warden, uh, he figured out I was taking 16 Gs. Wow. That's hit. amazing. Well, let's take a look at uh, exactly what the, the space shuttle uh, was. Uh, and this, again, is from the 1978 edition of Highlights of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. I want to thank uh, uh, Feld Entertainment for allowing us to use uh, these clips too. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at, this is the entire act here. You're gonna see folks. Well, 
He's walked the outside of the whirling wheel of death, blindfolded. He lunged from 45 feet above the ground to be caught only at the last second by his heels. And now the death-defying Elvin Bale is going to risk his life again as he becomes the first human space shuttle. Elvin is going to be shot out of this rocket, which has been especially designed just for him, at a speed of over 100 miles an hour. Now he will be hurled clear across the arena into that narrow net. Now, this is something that has net. never been done before. Elvin, uh, could I ask you a question? Sure, Dave. Do you have anything to say before you attempt this terrifying stunt? Uh, no, not really, just that uh, I hope I make it. Oh, well, we, uh, we do too. We certainly do too. Uh, if you're crazy enough to attempt it, Elvin, we're crazy enough to watch you. Good luck. Thank you, Dick. You're welcome. Well, there he goes. And uh, hopefully, as he puts it, Elvin Bale will surpass himself as he attempts to tempt fate and do something that has never, ever been done before. <laughs> All right, Elvin, are you ready for the countdown? Ready. Five, four, three, two, one, five! That was uh, a little different than the traditional Zacchini uh, Canon Act that we've seen. You designed this, right? Yeah. So, so uh, tell me a little bit about it. I mean, it was it's it's not, and obviously you had the Canon later, but this particular uh, device, I mean, it's so small. It's almost like a little capsule. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I have to say that um, I have to thank the Fells because. Irvin Feld had a lot of trust in me. And I'll never forget the first time that I wanted to do something other than the trapeze. Uh, I went to Mr. Feld and I heard that he was, oh, look, there's, right, that's, um, yeah, that's one of the astronauts right there. And I was showing him how, how it was built, basically. That's great. But anyway, that's, yeah. Uh, so they had a lot of trust in me and I had already done, the motorcycle on the high wire, I'll never forget, but Mr. Feld, I said, Mr. Feld, I'd like to do the motorcycle on the high wire. He said, what? I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. He said, well, who, who are you going to do it with? And I, because you knew there was two, because um, Joe Guzman was on the show to begin with in 1969. Yep. So he said, who, who are you going to do it with? And I knew at that time that Vicki Eunice was on the show, but she hadn't been contracted to come back for another season. So I said, well, Vicky will do it. And I hadn't even talked to Vicky about it. He <laughs> said, Vicky will do it? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, well. He said, well, do you know how to build that? I said, sure. He said, do you think you could do that? And I said, Mr. Feld, if I can do that trapeze act, I can do anything. So he said, okay, fine. Now that picture, I was unconscious. And everybody that looks at that said, well, why aren't your arms out front? And that's because the stroke on that rocket was six feet. Most of the cannons these days are 15 feet, 20 feet, 18 feet, which is the, the distance of travel that, this, that the capsule goes up inside the barrel to shoot you out. So it's called the stroke. That stroke was only six feet. And I was, I was unconscious for the first couple of seconds when I first came out. And that was St. Petersburg. That's the first town we worked. So I wasn't used to the cannon yet. It, was, it wasn't wow. until another week later that I was able to 
my brain was was able to get used to taking that hit because it was like getting hit by a like a by a truck. Because think about it, six feet is not a lot to, no, to not. somebody out. And after the season, I said to Mr. Feld, "Oh, I have to change the stroke and make it a little longer." So I was able to make it from six feet to eight feet, which, trust me, in those days, that was a huge difference to me. So, you know, obviously, um, you left. You not long after, uh, a few years later, you left the Ringling Show. Um, you took the cannon with you. You were working uh, with Chipper Fields in Hong Kong. And on um, January the 8th, 1987, uh, you got into the cannon and your life changed forever. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, let me just correct you by saying when I left Ringling in the end of 63, I did not take the cannon that belonged no, to- No, when you left uh, later on uh, in 84. Was... Actually, I uh, left the end of 83. Yeah. Um, I didn't take the cannon. That the cannon that I have now, the world's largest cannon, that was actually built in South Africa. Oh, okay. I think when I was over in Africa, I designed that and I had that built there. But I I shipped it from there. It went to Hong Kong. From Africa, it went to Hong Kong, and then from Hong Kong, it came back to the states. So uh, I'm going to show a picture of that. Um, I'm I'm my own engineer here, so having a little. Uh, challenges you know that always come in these situations here but uh, this is the uh, cannon I guess that you're referring to here right yes that's the world's largest cannon of course the barrel was built in South Africa and I had actually built it um, with a bed in the top where the original idea was to shoot a dummy out first and miss the, the airbag because I was the first one to use an airbag for the cannon believe it or not really so the dummy was supposed to miss the airbag and it was dressed like me and missed the airbag. And then I was going to get shot out. That was the whole idea of that cannon. That's why it's kind of as, as large as it is because the dummy, I was on top. I was on top of the capsule waiting to shoot the dummy out that looked like me. And then I would transfer and get in and I would get in it and it would shoot me out. Gotcha. So um, tell us a little bit about, so, so was that the cannon that you took to Hong Kong? Yes. So tell us a little bit about uh, that story because uh, you know, I know that a lot of people are familiar with it, but uh, it's, it's so interesting, uh, especially how you have overcome the things that happened that day. Well, what happened was we'd been there for 16 days already in Hong Kong performing in the park. And uh, we were in the tent and I was getting shot into the airbag, but I wanted to do a longer shot because I got there kind of late and they'd already put riggings up and stuff like that. And, and we were doing two and three shows a day and nobody wanted to do move anything. So we waited until the day off, which was after the 16th day, we actually had a day off. So we were able to move some of the rigging so that I could do a longer shot. So what happened was um, the dummy, after we unloaded everything from the containers, all the extra equipment that we didn't use they put under the seats on the black, on the black top to store it while we were there. So anyway, uh, on the day off, we moved the airbag. I put the, the dummy in and shot the dummy to see how it landed. And it was a little short. So I powered up the cannon a little more to give it more power to get it into the center of the airbag. Actually, it's a little bit in front of the air, the center. And it was fine. So didn't think anything about it. I got in it. Five, four, three, two, one, boom. And the minute I came out, I knew that there was something wrong. I knew I was going too fast and too high. And I'm up in the top of my flight and I said, oh shit, you know, what am I gonna do? So I rotated like I was gonna land on my back and I rotated, tried to kind of land on my feet and try to, I thought maybe I could roll, but, I wasn't able to get turned over enough and I actually landed on my back and that's when uh, I broke uh, my shattered my spine basically on T11 and T12 which is the thoracic part that's just just above the the lumbar uh, vertebrae so anyway come to find out that the dummy 
had soaked up a lot of water on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, because it had been raining like crazy. And it soaked up the water. So obviously it's got it's sand inside this canvas bag. Inside this dummy is, is two by fours to give it the strength. And then around it is sand so that you don't break the net when, when it hits the net. You don't want to go through the net. So it's sand to kind of you know absorb some of the hit when it hits the net. So anyway, the sand had soaked up a lot of water and it had gained weight and I didn't know it when we put it in the cannon because I didn't put it in by myself because it weighed 170 pounds because it's supposed to weigh about 20 pounds more than the live body because dead weight flies further than live weight. Anyway, that's all technical stuff. So um, anyway, it had gained the weight. So I had actually set the cannon's power for the dummy, which was much heavier than me. So when I got on it being lighter, I flew further. And that's what happened. Well, you, um, all of us, all of us who remember when that happened in 1987, uh, obviously we were, you know, we were so concerned, uh, but the life that you have lived since then is a real tribute to you, Elvin. Uh, the fact that you have not let it slow you down at all. And uh, you have a beautiful family now. Uh, you've continued to work as a circus manager. Uh, a lot of us remember you from being on the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers and the Cole Brothers Circuses. Um, how did you make that, decide to make that transition into circus management and being an agent for other brothers? Yeah, it's funny. When I was in the hospital in Hong Kong, Queen Mary Hospital, I got a visit from Chuck Smith. And I don't know if you know who that is. Sure, he from was, the Ringling Show. Yeah. So Chuck came over because he was there getting concessions made. You know, that's where they have all the concessions made. Uh, and he came in the hospital, see me, and he said, oh, my God. He said, yeah. He said, I, we all thought you were, you were dead. We thought you shot yourself. You committed suicide. And I said, why, why would you think that, Chuck? He said, because in the newspaper, it said, man, shot, you know. Uh, yeah the wording but the translation from Chinese to English was like it sounded like I'd shot myself oh in the uh. news so they thought that I'd shot myself but I hadn't shot myself like you know it was a cannon so anyway yeah so I'm I actually um was in the hospital in in Hong Kong for quite a while for a couple of months and then they transferred me to a place called Stoke Mandel uh not Stoke Mandeville, Maclaho, which was a rehab center in, in Hong Kong. And I was there for another uh, month and a half to two months. And then um, I didn't seem to be getting a great deal of help there. So I then heard about uh, Stoke Mandeville in London, England, which was a very famous uh, rehab center. So I went to London, England, um, and I spent another two months there in England and, and they were very good. They they didn't, they it's really funny about the Chinese. The the doctor, the professor that, that operated on me, you know, he said, oh, he'll never walk again. That kind of thing. They were not very, they said, you're gonna be depressed and you're this and you're that. And oh my God, it was really very depressing just to hear them talk about how I'm not gonna be able to do anything. So anyway, when I came back to Stoke Mandeville, I had braces on my legs, I was able to get up. I was able to go, go upstairs and come downstairs and all that kind of thing and, and take care of myself, you know, live a normal life. And thank God I'm what they call an incomplete paraplegic. I do have use of my legs a little bit, but not enough to walk without crutches. Yes. And, you know, um, and, you know, here, obviously, a lot of us remember seeing you around the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers or the Cole Brothers lot. Here you are with John Pugh uh, and your golf cart, which uh, I know was a real lifesaver for you on a lot of those muddy lots. Yeah, well, actually, I didn't use the golf cart except for the last couple of years. Before that, I just had an electric cart because it was easier to get in and out of the tent rather than the golf cart. Sure. But so when I when I got back to the States, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I I thought maybe I could get a job working one of the bridges. You know, we have those bridges in Venice, two of them. And I said, maybe uh, I could- The drop bridge up. operator? Yeah, something like that. And then I said, you know, it's funny because I got a lot of people calling me and Johnny Pugh called me and said, hey, do you know of any good acts in Europe? Because I know you were there for five years. And I said, yeah, I know a lot of good acts from Europe. Mr. Feld asked me the same thing actually. And um, so I said, yeah, I'm, 
you know, I could find someone. So then I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll become an agent. So I started a company called Axe International. And then Tommy Hannaford called me and said, hey, Elvin, um, why don't you be my, my, my agent? He said, exclusive agent. He said, you and me. He said, Axe International. He said, we become right. partners. I said, sure. Sounded great. So I actually worked for Tommy booking a lot of his acts for the first, I think it was about a year. And then he started booking somebody else, kind of talked him into, and I'm not going to mention their name, another agent. So he booked a couple of acts from them. And I said, hey, Tommy, I said, that that wasn't our agreement. I said, so I'll tell you what. I said, I'd rather just be on my own. He said, okay, no problem. So I bought him out and I did my own thing. And I was booking acts for... Uh, Johnny Pugh, and I was booking acts for a couple of other circuses. And then uh, I put the cannon on, on Johnny's show because he wanted the cannon. So I put the world's largest cannon on the show. And then I got a call from um, Carden, George Carden. George Carden, yeah. And George called me and said, hey, you know, I'd like you to book some acts for me. He said, can we have a meeting? And I said, sure. So he said, come up to Pittsburgh. So I flew up to Pittsburgh and he had his show there. So basically I put a deal together with George to become his sole agent. And I did. And I was with George for three years. And let me tell you, we worked really hard. He had three shows at that time. So I worked really hard putting shows together with him, working sometimes half the night and getting up early in the morning and working with him. And he, we became really good friends. George, George is a very smart guy. And and did a, a heck of a job with his shows. Very successful uh, in the business of indoor circuses. And, yeah. uh, and I know you were a part of months that. Ago and he said, hey, Elvin, guess what? I said, what? He said, I just bought Siegfried and Roy's ha uh, palace. I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, nobody knows yet. He said, I just bought it. He said, I'm gonna, yeah. He said, it's, it's gonna be terrific. I said, George, what are you gonna do with that? So then he told me what he's gonna do with it. But I, I don't wanna say anything because I don't know if he wants me to. <laughs> okay. but, but anyway, so yeah, we became good friends. And then after I, I ended up leaving George after three years because I, I was the kind of, and anybody will tell you this, I was the kind of agent that was involved. I wanted to be involved with my, with my performers because that's what I did. I, I, I had a license. I was a licensed agent in the state of Florida. I still am. And I felt that it was important that I represent my agent, my, my performers. And sometimes I'd kind of get into it with George because he'd ask the impossible from some of these people. And I'd sometimes argue with him about it. And one day he wanted the impossible from one of the big acts. And I won't mention their name. And I said, they won't do it, George. I don't care. You tell them effing people, if they're not there, I'll never hire them again. And all of that. And he's cussing and carrying on because he could do that, George. And so I said, you know what, George? I said, I'm sorry. That's it. I can't take it anymore. He said, oh, okay, go home. He said, go home. And he got mad at me. So I did. So then um, basically when I got home, I was talking to Johnny and he said, well, I could use some help. So I basically went on the road as Johnny's assistant. I think that was in 1994 or something like that. So then I was on Johnny's show for 20, 22 years, I think it was. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Uh, I mean, you were with the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers and the Cole Brothers Circus as long as you were with any individual show, right? Longer. Almost. Well, basically, if you count all the years I was with Ringling, that was 25 years. Yeah, from the beginning. 25 years with Ringling from the beginning, yeah. So um, I, we have so many people on the line who uh, want to talk to you. And if you have a, a comment or a question for Elvin, put it in the chat. We'll get to it. I want to show another video here, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap this thing up uh, in a couple of minutes. This particular video here shows a couple of the acts that you have spoken about already, the motorcycle act and also your monster act. Uh, this is from uh, 1982. And um, let's take a look here. This is uh, John Boy Walton was the uh, host of the show. Elvin Bale is, is just a guy who's uh, grown up in the circus and would like to be known as the circus daredevil. So I built this new motorcycle and we're doing now a, a wheelie on the highway, which is really incredible. And it's a great thrill for me. I love doing the motorcycle because, again, I can get really high 
in the buildings I will go right to the apex of the arena if it's 100 feet or if it's 60 feet or whatever it is and I get way way up there on like in the clouds so to speak and it's, it's a big thrill the monster is a brand new concept and again it's it's mechanical so therefore you never know um, what can go wrong with it and that's one of my biggest fears I'm confident in myself but I don't know if the mechanical monster is gonna break down in the middle of a trick or something and that can be very dangerous for example the boom could uh, default or I could have a hydraulic leak and the thing could come down and the mechanical part of it is what really worries me but the wheel for me is a great thrill as the monster is and the motorcycle on the and highway. again this is with uh, we are Chris going Adams to be doing something that's something never been done not before I'm gonna try to hold him two man high walking around on the outside very impressive Yeah, you can see the wheels wobbly. That's like 45 feet in the air. Amazing. to uh, perform in front of an audience and hear them cheer and scream. And I love the kids when they come up to me and say, wow, you scared me to death. I got a big kick out of that. Sometimes the people... So uh, terrific, uh, Elvin, really. I, I, uh, you know, I think that we've been able to see you actually perform. Uh, we obviously have had the opportunity to uh, hear directly from you uh, what it's been like to be a part of some of the greatest circuses uh, of our time. Uh, going back really to the under canvas era in the 1950s and, and even some of those European programs, uh, obviously a major award winner. Uh, we've had everybody on the line here, uh, Belinda De, uh, DeBelli, who was a blue unit showgirl. Uh, she said that she tried to catch your act anytime that she could. Uh, Bruno uh, Loyal is uh, on the phone uh, from Cal New Caledonia. Uh, Samoa, and he says uh, he's. It's a great to see you, David Carlion, uh, who one of our clowns uh, from the Ringling Show, also Circus Historical Society Board of Trustee, uh, was just saying what a privilege it is for him to have been on the Ringling Show with such a, such a consummate pro. And Stuart uh, Eisenberg, one of the promoters on the Ringling Show, said That's that uh, you know when you were on the show, it was really a pleasure to work with you. Your performances were dazzling. Your willingness to help the promoters greatly appreciated. So uh, Elvin Bale, uh, again, uh, and it looks like Sarah Chapman wants to say hi too. <laughs> yeah, so, hi. So we've got uh, a nice group of you people. All. God, it reminds me of the old days. Oh my God. Good to see all of you. So Elvin Bale, thank you for joining us for this episode of Circus History Live. Again, we get together every month. Uh, we look forward to seeing uh, all of you uh, next month for another edition. And Elvin, thanks. I'll turn it back over to Bruce now. You're welcome. Take care, guys. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Alvin, for uh, appearing on Circus History Live. This was a fabulous program. And, and thank you, Chris, uh, our vice president for hosting. And behind the scenes, uh, CHS trustee Anya Norris, thank you for handling the advance uh, promotion. If we, if you can, uh, on Facebook and our, our social media channels, as well as handling our YouTube re uh, recording. And tonight, a special thank you to Eileen Barney for her for handling the recording controls tonight. Uh, and finally, thank you to everyone else for attending this program. Uh, this is a great part of Circus History, uh, Circus Historical Society. It's a way to preserve history. And if you're not already a member, please join. It's only $60 a year. And you get a, a four issues of our bandwagon journal, which is phenomenal. Uh, and again, thank you so much for attending tonight. And we'll see you next month. So long, everyone. Take care. Bye, guys.